Thanks, Scott. And, uh, thank you all for bringing this conversation together. I think there's a great need for us to talk about practices and talk about how we continue to work on board. I don't have any disaster pictures. I don't have flooding to show you. We don't have a gigantic problem that's presented itself. Um, we have the, the very traditional sleeper problem that seems like it's rising. Um, I'm going to go through rather a different approach to this, though. I'm going to talk about how we've been changing practices in the city. And it's leading up to what we're doing about climate change. But I think it's important to recognize that we've had to learn how to change. <laughs> And I think uh, when John Englander spoke this morning, we're, we're dealing with a problem that we in our humankind history have never had before. The sea has always been where it has been, and that's been good enough, right? So um, let me uh, also offer this bit of a perspective. I'm at an economic development and planning agency. I'm an architect, I'm a planner. I uh, have no jurisdiction over city facilities. It's really the, the city's planning and private development in the city that we regulate. So I actually exist in a much more market-sensitive space. Um, like Cologne, the uh, state sets the building code. So we don't have a building code tool. Um, and I'm sure it's the case with New Jersey. Massachusetts doesn't actually like municipalities getting into the building code. They actually have a law that says you can't regulate what we regulate. So uh, I think we've probably been clever in how we use zoning and how we anticipate using zoning or um, maybe even using zoning. But let me go back a little bit in time and really talk about practice transformation. And uh, here's what I'll, I'll go over. Um, which is, is, is kind of our story around sustainability and really setting up the game. And that was uh, back in about 2002 when we took up the conversation around rebuilding practices and how municipalities might really get into the game of promoting green buildings. So uh, our mayor convened a task force, stakeholder, uh, people from the real estate industry, and we came out with recommendations, the usual sorts of things like lead by example, so city building green buildings. Uh, but we also stepped it up a bit, and in particular, we introduced zoning that required all private development in the city, over 50,000 square feet, to be LEED certifiable. So that was back in 2006. I think we were the first city to do that in the country. And it's been a, a, a born path now. A number of cities uh, throughout the nation have adopted similar zoning. What was remarkable about that is that it went over fairly quietly. We did the work pretty well, I think. But I think folks were seeing that this was a good thing to do. It was something they could do. And importantly, it was something that the market would recognize them for. So for the early adopters, there were early rewards. And now I think we're at a point where the <coughs> practice is mainstream. The rewards are fairly predictable. Um, practices are commoditized, and things move forward. Uh, we, and, and this is where it's fun, that a regulatory economic development agency, so we can set rules, and then we can set other practices. We uh, wanted to up the residential workspace, and so we introduced it. Uh, I'm going to go forward here, actually. Slides. Uh, let me back up a little bit. Today, Boston's uh, probably in the top 20 cities with, uh, in terms of green buildings. But I think what's also important is that we have green buildings that aren't certified. A lot of our buildings are actually really very good buildings. They didn't pursue certification. Uh, and and we, we have the benefit of literally whenever when anyone builds a building, they're probably building a green building because there's no way to build great <laughs> um, So this is our residential uh, uh, game changer here. And that is introducing energy positive green buildings. And I think in a way, it sort of gets to where Steve's going, which is how can you start to see your city a bit more holistically? Can your buildings, can your residences start contributing to the grid? And so uh, these are uh, a pilot, these four were completed last year. Um, we're actually in the, the final you know, month of the energy positive measure, so we're <laughs> looking at the, uh, the, the short days of uh, December for uh, solar energy generation on these otherwise very efficient homes. But these four um, were very short of the energy positive. And the quick here is that they are very, very efficient homes. It's about a third of the energy of a, of a new code compliant home. And then they have a PV array on the roof. 
Um, the market responded delightfully here. This is in our Roxbury neighborhood. It's not prime real estate. Uh, all four of these homes sold before construction was completed. They sold about 50% over the market. So uh, anybody who doubted the market for residential, they're wrong. Um, and here we have homes that are powering our grid. Um, we stepped the game up and we, uh, we've scaled the program up and we've got a, uh, uh, a, about a two acre site that we're uh, planning about 44 units of energy positive homes. And I think again, we're going to see the ability to scale these practices and start to envision a future city where you could get your energy from your neighborhoods, where it's clean, where it's reliable, where uh, these homes will have uh, energy regardless of what's going on with the grid. But the other thing, and I'll touch on this in the end, is these are actually really beautiful, lovely places. And I think that's a part of our, our vision for going forward. Um, scaling further, we have adopted need for neighborhood development as part of our zoning requirements. And so when Edinburgh, there's a project that's a multi-building project, they also have to build to need for neighborhood development standards. And so the, what that gets us is a more collective strategy around the buildings. It's a much more urban strategy. You know, how the buildings relate to streetscape, how do they reinforce the, the patterns, the connectivities, but also it introduces green infrastructure requirements, which I think will play significantly into resiliency in the future. Um, we've also taken lead for neighborhood development into master planning. And again, this is a tool, it's a checklist, it's a rating system. It is not a design or a strategy or anything like that. You still need to be very good about your planning and designing. What it does though is it gives you some assurance that you hit all the things you need to hit. And then interestingly enough, and especially in this Columbia Point planning process, it gave us credibility with the community. When they saw that this plan was uh, achieving lead silver in the neighborhood development rating system, they actually got behind it in ways that really surprised me. And I, as, a, as a planner in a city, we're often selling the, the, the double hit of, of you know, density and connectivity. We kind of always want more big buildings, right? And we're always getting pushed back on that, usually at the local level. Here, they begun to really understand differently from our pitch that density and sustainability went hand in hand. So they supported, I, I think, one of the more proactive plans in the city. Um, our struggle right now is getting the developers to build it out to that scale. They're usually the ones who are struggling at not getting it, uh, enough building capacity. Uh, <clears throat> we're continuing to step up the game a little bit. And if you see it, Lead ND as a planning tool, I'd, I'd encourage you to see eco districts as an operational model. So it's looking at how a community or business area or a residential area could work together and begin to tackle problems collectively that individually are available to them. And this gets us into some interesting practices around waste management, around uh, uh, low impact development strategies or new stormwater management strategies, but it also introduces uh, distributed energy and resilient energy strategies. So we can start to uh, push clean and resilient energy uh, through these models on a business case. So the city would absolutely be a partner in this. Uh, we're looking at, um, in the area to the right is, uh, uh, let's see if I This area here is called the Boston Marine Industrial Park, and the BRA owns these assets. Um, we are a, a self-financing redevelopment company. Uh, because we own this area, we can actually run wires and pipes in the street. We don't have a franchise issue with local utilities. So we have a, an opportunity to deploy uh, microgrids and offer businesses in this area both clean and renewable energy. Uh, about a year ago, we started requiring private development projects to complete a climate change preparedness checklist. And this was uh, really introduced in the same way that we introduced green building practices, which was we started with asking, what is it that you are doing? What might you do better? What practices might we share with others? Uh, as we learned, we have begun to turn some of these questions into 
threshold requirements. We want to see floors that are higher. We want to see the ability for ground floors to be raised at new later dates in the building's uh, life cycle. Uh, we want to see obvious things like uh, critical systems moved off the ground floors, things like that. But we also want to see storage of on-site potable water. We want to see storage of uh, waste water. We want buildings to be able to function without standard utility services. And bear in mind, you have to have water, you have to have wastewater capacity, you have to have energy for a building to be occupiable. Take any one of those out of the questions and then the building's down. So this is Spalding Rehab. It's our poster child of, of a future resilient building. Um, it's, it's sitting on the water. It's got lots of lovely strategies. You, you've heard about many of them. Um, so I, I won't go into these here. But uh, I think some of the cool things are the, the entry room is actually a landing pad. Um, it's an evacuation route from the second floor. So if this is underwater, they've got a filter dock. Uh, they also you know, creatively use the landscape to, to introduce a velocity uh, buffer for wave actions, things like that. Uh, last thing I want to talk about is our living with water, cost of living with water design competition. Um, and this really gets into the practice space too, which is how do you get everyone comfortable with what's going on? How do you get everyone knowledgeable with what's going on? And then importantly, how do you start to gather good solutions? So this is active right now. Love you all to respond. Put together a cool, diverse team. Um, we're looking at uh, sites that offer different scales from a building to a neighborhood to a, an infrastructure-based solution. Um, we're trying to be very pragmatic about this. Um, this is a building on the North End. It's a historic rehab. This is Boston in a nutshell. and lots of other East Coast cities. Um, I want to run a quick progression of, of maps here, um, which you, you should be seeing as the slow uh, inundation that would happen uh, as we head toward a hundred year storm, which is which is at this point right now. This uh, building that we're site we're focusing on would be entirely surrounded by water, uh, as would be the, the surrounding area. We're also using that hundred year five foot uh, hundred year flood level would be the equivalent of uh, five feet of sea level rise and our, our monthly high tide. So we're looking at uh, regular flood conditions. Uh, I'm going to go quickly here. This is our neighborhood site. It's a, a blank slate. Parking lots will be redeveloped, so it's a real neat opportunity. Uh, this is our current master plan. We want to see the new master plan. We want to see a truly visionary master plan. This is uh, an infrastructure or arterial called Mercy Boulevard. that serves our Columbia Point neighborhood. Um, the JFK library is out there. UMass uh, campus is, is situated all right here. This is a, a large residential development that uh, unfortunately will mostly be underwater. Um, there are all sea level rise scenarios. And again, looking for a new master plan. So let me wrap up on this because I think as we go forward, how we get there is going to be as important as what it is we're doing. It's really important to have leadership, uh, both at the elected level but the stakeholders. You've got to have the stakeholders at the table. Partnership's critical. I can point to all of these different things and tell you about the different partners. The sea level rise competition is with the state. It's with uh, a local uh, organization called the Boston Harbor Association, but it's also with the, uh, the local foundation that's funding the work. Uh, real important in our space is commoditizing practices. Where will the market recognize good practices? Where will they be rewarded for what they're doing? Um, regulatory, we are as creative. I'm a terrible bureaucrat, I'll tell you right now. I will bend the rules, I'll abuse the rules until someone tells me not to. Um, <laughs> if it's toward a good end, that is. Um, but I think it's very important to understand standards and framing uh, practices. You have to really play around with both. Uh, and then, most importantly, I think we have to go at this with you know, a vision, something very compelling, very far reaching but something that we can achieve. We've covered a great deal of ground in the green building space by talking about what it is we could do while aspiring to do better. And I think for all of us in Boston, we, we really aspire for Boston not just to respond to climate rise and climate change, but to really become a far more resilient city, a more sustainable city, and certainly a more beautiful city. I think we can look back at, at our long history, and, and the city looked nothing like it does today 100 years ago. We should not expect it to look anything like it does today 100 years from now. It'll be more beautiful.